I'm Aria Schwartz, and welcome to the WNBA Insider Show. Each week, we cover different topics important to the W. Using X's and O's along with key stats, we bring honest and critical analysis. This episode, we are honored to have a well-known name around these parts, Brady Klopfer. He's been on our show a bunch. He's based out of L.A., and if you want Sparks News Insight or anything WNBA-related, go follow him on Twitter and make sure you follow his writings all over the place. As always, if you like our show, please consider joining our Patreon community. For less than a cup of coffee a month, you can directly show support to the hard work we do covering the W. Brady, welcome to the show. How you doing, man? Doing well. Thanks for having me. How are you? Good, good, good. You know, the season, it feels like the off season lasts 100 summers, or I guess 100 winters, if you will. Um, and then the second that, you know, New Year's hits, it's just like a sprint to the season. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. And it's it's fun, though. Like, as soon as, as, soon as we get to May, really, is, is you get the training camp starting, you get kind of the last minute trades and... And it feels like the season's already here in a way because you really start to see the momentum that some teams are getting, even though the games haven't been played. And it's fun. It's a lot of fun. It's going to be a good year. Yeah, it's going to be a great year. I got to say, I think uh, we're going to see a lot of growth in the league itself this year, even with all the big names missing. Um, Brady, talk to me. A lot of stuff's been been going on over in uh, La La Land. Talk to me. What's going on there? It's been crazy. I mean, it. It was such a fascinating offseason for the Sparks just because obviously after, you know, all the crazy stuff with the coaching, with Brian Agler resigning, which felt out of the blue for many people, and Derek Fisher, which was obviously a controversial signing. And then after, you know, the dust settled on that, it really started to feel like a Liz Cambage trade was going to happen. And I think a lot of people kind of forgot about the rest of the team because all the eyes were on, all right, is there going to be a Cambage trade? Is there not going to be a Cambage trade? I, I would take it a step further and say a lot of people forgot about the rest of the league. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Liz Cambage was the only topic, really, for kind of like February, March, and April. Um, and then the Sparks kind of moved on after draft night, drafted Kalani Brown, which was certainly an interesting pick that, you know, a lot of people really liked, a lot of people really didn't like. Then they went and traded Odyssey Sims to the Lynx, which was um, maybe not a huge move on the court, but a, a pretty big move just in terms of, you know, the finances, the rivalry that Sims has had with Minnesota, et cetera, et cetera. And then they're all ready to ready to go for training camp. And just a few days before that starts, boom, Shanae Grumike is traded. So it's been it's been crazy. They've been about as active as I can remember a WNBA team being in an off season. And, and all of that was with Chelsea Gray unsigned until, you know, just about a week ago when she finally, it was, everyone knew she was going to sign. So it wasn't like there was really any intrigue there, but that lasted until, you know, pretty much the 11th hour for her to actually re up with the team. I got, I got to say my, my assumption of the Chelsea Gray thing was, or with, all right, like you said, everyone was kind of waiting for that 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 uh, Liz Cambage trade, and with the Chelsea Gray move, why it waited so long? Obviously, there's many possibilities. My assumption, and this isn't based on anything other than just like looking at the numbers. My assumption was that you were trying to keep some. If I'm LA, I'm trying to keep a little bit more freedom in the cap space to make some off season moves. You know Chelsea's coming back. Everyone knows. And you're going to get her as much money as humanly possible. But from what we saw last season, I don't think simply changing your head coach is going to turn this team from, you know, a bubble 500 team to all of a sudden the top contender. Uh, am I crazy for thinking that? No, no. You're right for, for both of those statements you just made. Like really quickly on the on the Chelsea front, that's definitely what was going on. You know, a lot of people asked me, why hasn't she resigned? Are the, are the Sparks worried she's going to sign elsewhere? She was a restricted free agent. She could have signed anywhere at any time and forced the Sparks hand if she wanted to. She knew what the deal was. Uh, for people that don't know, she and Cam Beige share the same agent. So she was, you know, aware of what the situation was at all times. She wanted to return to the Sparks. She knew the Sparks wanted her back 
every side was on the same on the same page in terms of we're going to wait, we're going to see what happens with Cam Beige, we're going to see what happens if we can clear space with Sims and Lavender, and then at the end we're obviously going to bring you back. We're just going to wait till then so that we have the clearest picture. So you're absolutely right there, and you're absolutely right with with the talent on the team and a, and a coaching change. It, it's going to take a lot more than that. Obviously, the Brianna Stewart injury helped the Sparks. I, I hate to use the word helped with something like that, but you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Uh, it it opens the door a little bit more for them to contend even if they didn't get better. Uh, but they obviously felt the need to do a lot more than just make a coaching change, and you saw that with how aggressive the rumors were around Cam Beige, even if that trade never happened, and you obviously saw it with them ultimately trading for Shanae. Yeah, and 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 we're gonna well, let's break down some of the LA moves. When I look at the Odyssey Sims trade, if we want to run down the timeline, I believe she signs a restricted free agent contract with the Phoenix Mercury very quickly. And this, I think, actually, I want your take on this. Were you shocked at all that LA matched the offer for Odyssey Sims to keep her? I was. I was very shocked, actually. Um, I think. Glad to know I'm not. <laughs> I think it was a good move ultimately. But here's the thing, Arya. I believe that what they ultimately did by flipping her was the plan all along. I don't think they wanted to keep Odyssey Sims, especially at that price point. Uh, mm-hmm. She was not a good fit on this team from a talent standpoint, just with the fact that they lack shooting. And that's something that she absolutely cannot do. She's just not a long range shooter. She does a lot of things well, but that's not one of them. Um, and she wasn't a fit with the team off the court either. It this was a team that for as much love and happiness as they have for each other, the chemistry wasn't quite there the way you would have expected a year ago. Uh, And she just didn't fit great with that team. Things didn't work out great with Odyssey in LA. I don't think she wanted to be there at all. I don't think she wanted the Sparks to match that contract. When they matched it, I was very surprised because I didn't think they had any intention of bringing her back. And so now that we have the benefit of hindsight, I think the move to trade her was ultimately the idea all along. Because basically now what they did is they picked up Alexis Jones for nothing. If they didn't want Odyssey Sims and they were going to let her walk, now instead you match the contract and you trade her for Alexis Jones and you basically got Alexis Jones for free because you never wanted Odyssey Sims in the first place. Yeah, and I, I hear that. I think if you look back at at some of uh, some of my tweets or my hot takes, if you will, around that trade or around around when Sims when they matched the Sims offer for Mercury, I think it was quite obvious. You know, this is a trade bait. They, I, I, I don't want to simplify it that much. Actually, I want to say this: one, we know looking at the Mercury, this is a team that was on the cusp of going to the finals, and not to be crass or anything, but LA was far from that. Now, if you're LA, if you're Penny, you're a competitive person. You're not just going to give good tools to a team that's almost at the height. You're, and so when I, when I saw them make that, that re-sign, two things stood out to me. One, trade bait. Now they have someone who they can use who showed a few seasons back she can be a top uh, a guard, a top, a top scorer in this league. The combo of her and Gray two seasons ago – was ridiculous. Uh, we, we saw some very impactful, very important things coming from her. It, was it two or three seasons ago where she just had that breakout? Season? Two seasons ago, yeah. Two seasons ago. Um, and then the other thing is I go back to when Odyssey re-signed after two seasons ago, so after that season, then going into this past year, and I remember reading an article that came out about that signing and talking about it, and essentially – Odyssey, and if you look at the High Post Hoops um, contract uh, salary database, you can see it also. Odyssey, before that, you know, really signed, for lack of a better terms, a crap contract, and then was signed to a much better contract. Well, because of the whole, you know, matching the offer. Any team that was going to sign her was basically going to throw a ton of money at her and say, come to us, and hopefully you can get LA to kind of chicken on that and say, you know what? No, we're not even going to take that risk because that's a huge loss. If they can't get that trade done to, to Minnesota uh, with this whole, you know, 
signing after the restructuring. If yeah, you will. it was a really, really risky move. And I have to think that Phoenix was really kind of thrown off by LA matching that. I, I have to think that they assumed that it was a done deal when, when they signed her to the offer sheet that LA wasn't going to match. So you're right that, that they really kind of threw a curveball at the Mercury. They screwed them over a little bit, which I'm sure Penny is very happy about. And um, ultimately yeah. it did work out, but you're right. It's a very, it's a very risky, risky move. Though the one thing I will say um, just to kind of add to this, cause I've been asked about this a fair bit. They, a lot of people were, were confused when they made that trade because Sims had been a restricted free agent and what the, you know, legality was with that. So just to clarify for people, if you're, if you sign re-sign as a restricted free agent, you can only be traded if you consent to it. So it's to me, that makes it pretty clear as if it weren't already pretty clear that Sims didn't want to be in LA, that she was willing to be traded to Minnesota because they can't make that trade without her approval. And my guess is she mm -hmm. said, you send me anywhere. I'll do it. Yeah. Cause, cause then you, you know, she can get traded, you know, whatever, all that. Exactly. After it. Totally. I, I do think, though, so the common phrase or the common response I've heard is, oh, we got Alexis Jones for nothing. And if you're a Sparks fan, you remember Alexis Jones from those daggers uh, from the Lynx when the Lynx won in the finals against L.A. But if you're not an L.A. fan, if you're a Minnesota fan, I think you're not. There's a lot of potential in Alexis Jones. I'm very high in Alexis Jones. I've said this. For now, this was going to be my second season saying it. Now I can't. But if Minnesota was going to succeed, make leaps, Alexis Jones needed to make leaps with them. And that team is so reliant on her doing that. Now you bring Alexis over to an L.A. team that is just stacked in the roster. I understand maybe not at the guard position. Is Alexis a lock to make this Sparks roster? And that's the question I keep asking myself and asking other people when we're discussing this trade. Yes, it's great if you if you can just drop Sims for nothing, even if even if you don't get Alexis Jones out of it. I think if you're looking from LA's perspective, you want to get rid of Sims no matter what. But do you think Alexis is a lock to make this roster? You know, I'm glad you asked that because I was actually having this discussion a few days ago on Twitter with a lot of people. So when the Sparks announced their training camp roster, I went through it and kind of broke everyone into three categories of lock virtual lock and bubble. And I had Alexis Jones in the bubble, but as the first name in the bubble, the favorite in that bubble and the locks and near locks I had for the sparks only totaled up to nine players. So three of those people that I had on the bubble have to make the roster. And I think that she is, is pretty clearly at the top of of the people who I would consider on the bubble for LA. So in a way that almost makes her a lock just because so many long shot bubble people would have to surpass her to make this roster. Uh, but in terms of what she's proven, you know, as much as she's hurt the sparks in the past, I still think she has, has to prove some things to really earn her spot in the W but just with the lack of of depth the sparks have they're such a top heavy team at the moment i would be very very surprised if she didn't make the roster everyone knows she can score and every time i've spoken to her last season and before that her focus has always been defense can she take her defense to that next level and if she can i think you're talking about a player who's going to have a long career in the w uh, maybe not one of those players who's going to you know be on the sparks for the next 30 years but someone who is going to have a long, meaningful career in this season. Not to harp on that too much. Let's move on to the next big move that happened. Uh, you touched on it briefly. The sisters are reunited. Shanae Gumake moves back, or not moves back, but it is back with her sister in L.A. And there's a lot of mixed reactions on this. I think it's interesting to say the least because one of the first things we all talked about, and I know you and I have, have had this conversation many a times, if Liz was going to go to L.A., the conversation was always, what does that lineup look like, assuming you don't give up anything for it, 
right? So you ha- that means Parker's starting at the three, Liz at the five, NECA at the four, or any combination of that that you really want. Um, but I think it would just have to be Liz at the five because right. of mobility. That being said, now we're in a situation where you go from getting a just a dominant size and post presence and just the Liz Cambage effect, if you will, to now having, and excuse my language, two undersized bigs as you're starting four and five. They're very skilled players. They have high energy. They have that athleticism. But the knock for both of these sisters has always been the lack of size. And when you combine that with the issues of rebounding that this team has consistently had, honestly, adding Shanae as assuming she's a starter, and I know we were both on that call with uh, with her the other day. She said, "I'm down for any position that helps my team." I think it's it, to some extent it's safe to assume she's a starter. Definitely. And to me, how does that lineup look? I mean, do, what are your main concerns? I guess looking at that starting five, there are a lot of concerns for sure, and. You know, I talked with with Candace Parker on Sunday was was the Sparks' first first day of training camp, and I asked her about that. I said, "You know, how's how is that fit going to work?" And she smiled this devilish grin and said, uh, "One of the perks of my job is I don't have to figure that out. That's for Derek Fisher to figure out." So you know, they're all aware. I asked Neca about it as well. They're all aware that it's going to be a challenge. It's not a seamless fit. You know, no one is under any false pretenses that they can just plug in Shanae and all of a sudden it's going to work magically. So the biggest concerns that I have is offensively, Shanae is not a shooter. It's never been a shooter. She's never implemented the three pointer into her game. And, you know, she was talking on that call that you referenced that, that's something that she feels she needs to work on and that she is working on. And I saw her in the gym on Sunday and, and her, her jumper from deep was looking pretty decent. So maybe that comes around at some point, but your spacing already isn't going to be good because NECA, even though she is a pretty good three point shooter, she's hesitant to shoot them that much. Uh, You have Elena Beard, obviously who doesn't stretch the floor out. So it's going to rely on Candace. I think having a more perimeter oriented game, she needs to be attacking a little bit more off the dribble instead of needing the ball in the post, just because they need to get some of their talent out of the paint and space things up. And then defensively, it's very interesting to me because I think it could go one of two ways. When I asked NECA about the fit, she said that, it's going to be a really big challenge to have three bigs on the floor at the one at one time. But then she kind of paused and said, but we're all pretty fast. So I think there is the potential for that versatility to work in their favor. I do think Candace Parker in particular has the lateral speed to defend some perimeter players pretty nicely. And one of the things that will be interesting to see is if they kind of go with a switch heavy defense to take advantage and use that size as an advantage rather than as a weakness. But ultimately, like you said, they're going for quality or quantity, not quality when it comes to size. They have three bigs, but none of them are particularly big. So you're still going to get hurt on the boards a little bit. Uh, hopefully for them, Kalani Brown plays a little bit of a role there as well. If she is able to, to get minutes despite all those bigs on the floor. So yeah, there are a lot of, there are a lot of question marks when it comes to that fit. And it's, it's a bold move. I'll say that. Oh, it's definitely a bold move. And I think I, I have, I have so many questions and answer this yes or no. Do you feel, when I look at LA, the two biggest question marks for me had to be the three ball and rebounding. Now, the Shanae trade kind of answers the rebounding question, kind of. Um, I think still you have similar issues to what we what we saw the Sparks having in issues before. And now you talk about the three ball and you touch on this also. I guess my question for you, and it can be a simple yes or no, or maybe if you want, um, but... Do you see, I mean, 
you broke down the starting five, the presumed starting five, and that's two players who even have the ability to shoot the three, um, to be quite blunt, in in Chelsea and Candice. Is that enough firepower from beyond the arc for this team to have um, a deep playoff run? I think I'm going to say no, but with a with a caveat. I don't I don't think that's enough just on the surface. But first off, I think there's a chance that they are able to fill in a lot of shooting off of the bench. Um, Alexis Jones obviously can provide that. Carly Samuelson's a, a player on the bubble. Mabry is on the bubble. There are some shooters that they can be bringing off the bench that could potentially improve that. Now, I'm very curious to see what Derek Fisher's offense looks like because Brian Agler's offense, with the lack of shooting that they have this year, it wouldn't work. It wouldn't come close to working. And that's not a a knock on Agler because I don't think they would have made this trade if they had Agler. Every, Every coach has their their strengths and their weaknesses. I would expect Derek Fisher to run a slightly more modern offense. And maybe what we see is some, is a lot more Candace Parker point forward and being willing to shoot off the dribble off of a high screen. Maybe we see a little bit more Chelsea gray, Candace Parker pick and rolls where you have to give up something to one of those players. It's going to take creativity And it's going to take bench contributions for it to work because on the surface, I do look at that and think there are some issues here. Now, the flip side is, in my opinion, assuming full health, this is the best defensive roster in the league. So maybe your offense doesn't need to fire on all cylinders at all times. Ooh, I think that might, uh, I'd consider that a hot take. I don't think, I think it. It's a hot take, but I, I I should clarify. I don't know that they're going to be the best defensive team, but I think one through five in their starting lineup is the most balanced defensively. They don't have they have plus defenders at all five positions with their starting roster. They might not have that superstar defender that a few other teams have, but there is no. There's no one player in that starting lineup that you are going to look at and, as an opponent and go, "All right, this is who we're attacking." Oh, definitely. I mean, I think if it and, and you, it's been hard to say that for a while in LA, just because you have Lena Beard, where Agler did an amazing job, an impeccable job of finding. Okay, this player, and I, I remember talking to him, or was it possibly to you also after I spoke to him? But what he would do last year is say, "Oh, you know." This player might be the best player on their on the other team's offense. But if I put my best defender on her, if I put Beard on her, she's going to be exhausted halfway through the game, and there goes my best defender. So instead, we're going to put her on the second best offensive player who really orchestrates the offense and just, you know, mess up that wheel and cause some issues all about. I think there's going to be a lot of questions. I agree with your analysis. This team doesn't exactly have a hole in the starting five, and I think – just if you listen to, you know, people who've been listening to this pod, if you rewind and start over, most of our critiques, if not all of them, have all been on the offensive side of the ball, not the defensive side of the ball. I do think defensively we're going to see some stuff from this team that's that's going to put a, a shake in your boot, if you will, and then put some questions to Atlanta about who is the best defensive team in the league. Something I want to ask you, and I don't think this is a, a long question, but Candace Parker, can, does she have the legs – the ability to play the three all season long. Um, I'm going to give this one with another caveat, caveat here. Yes, I do think she does, but I also think the way that they are going to rotate players in and out, even though I believe that they are going to start with that three big lineup, I think there will be times where we see them rotating into a two big lineup. So I think that while she'll start at the three, she is still going to spend a fair amount of time elsewhere. But I do think she has the leg. She is benefiting from a full offseason, which pretty much no other WNBA player except Shanae can say. Um, you know, she had no offseason commitments other than her broadcasting commitments. So her legs are pretty darn fresh. 
I think Fisher will manage her minutes quite a bit in the early going. And I think ultimately, you know, it's kind of a give and take on your legs, regardless of what position you're at. There's more cutting, more quick twitch muscles when you're out there at the three, but there's more impact when you're banging in the, in the post. So I think she'll be all right. She's, she's played a lot of three offensively throughout her career. I think she'll make it work defensively. I think they're going to be very switch heavy defensively, which I believe helps players physically last because you don't have to do quite as much. You don't have to fight through as much. You don't have to pop out quite as much. It just gives you a little bit more physical flexibility. But it's a big question for them. It's mm-hmm. absolutely a big question for them. But one thing I will say about about Candace Parker is no matter how high her workload is, she rarely seems to let it impact her. You can see at the ends of the season that she is toast and and needs to rest for a while and she's had injuries and things like that but there aren't very many times where you see her actually laboring on the court and think that she's worn out she's about as tough as they come I agree with that but it's a question you got to ask um absolutely you, you touched on this briefly when uh speaking about Derek and his coaching I think the biggest question mark for me is you know the orchestrator the person calling the plays if you will you know, how, what is Derek's coaching style? You spoke a little bit about a switch heavy defense. You spoke a little bit about a modern offense, something that's been racking my brain. When you look at this roster and I hate that I'm always comparing him to Agler. I, this isn't a comparison per se, but more so what we've seen in the recent past with this LA team is <clears throat> a very heavy starting lineup, a short rotation of bench players who actually get minutes. And I think a lot of that has to do with, older coaches trusting vets more, knowing more of their capability and trusting a player who's been in that experience more so than these young players. Have you gotten any sense from Derek? You know, is he, is he the type of guy who, who runs with the, with a little bit more of a rookie trust? Does he, does he side more so on vets pulling weight? Do you, do you have any sense of of what we're going to, are we going to see more minutes from the youth of this LA roster this coming season? I do think we are going to see a little bit more. Now, the one thing kind of going against that is that the first round draft pick, Kalani Brown, is a position where they have a lot of players. So that obviously doesn't make it easy for him to find playing time for maybe his, his his top rookie. But I do think he is going to be more trusting of young players than Agler. I think he is a little bit more modern in that way and you know it's worth noting i i i'm sorry to veer this away from the WNBA for a second uh but Derek fisher is a disciple of phil jackson who made his name as being a manager of people rather than a coach of players and trusting everyone on the team to come together for a greater purpose and just in what I heard from Fisher at the first at the first practice, both from overhearing him talking to players and from him talking to the media, he certainly gave off the impression that he is going to be trusting. He is going to give his players the opportunities that they need to succeed. And he has preached kind of since he was hired that he is going to adapt his coaching based on the personnel and based on the chemistry of the team rather than forcing something on the team and having them adapt to it. So to that end, I think he understands that maybe the best way to develop some of these young players is to actually have them playing minutes with Candace Parker and with Neka Grumake so that they are actually put in a position to both succeed and to see how things really should be operating at the highest level. So people are going to have to earn it, but I think he will give them that opportunity to earn it. I appreciate that. That's that's some good insight. And uh, Brady, why don't you tell the folks your uh, your Twitter handle? Uh, you can find me Brady Klopfer NBA. That's Klopfer K L O P F E R. 
I apologize for the NBA centric handle. I got it when I started covering the NBA and then was fortunate enough to start covering the WNBA. And I'm not sure if Twitter will let me change it, but I will work on that. (laughs) I appreciate it. So, all right, everyone, we're not going to judge Brady on that. But we, as at the Insider, believe very strongly in the WNBA and its community, and it's deserving of the same in-depth analysis and respect that men's coverage and men's sports receive on a daily basis. Please consider joining our Patreon community to help us support us and the work that we do. Brady, I want to thank you for joining us on the show today. Everybody, this has been the WNBA Insider Show.